Welcome to your personal test drive of the Sans Symphony V 8.0 storage virtualization software. You'll have about 10 minutes to get acquainted with its management interface. If that piques your interest, we can arrange a more extensive hands-on session through our network of solutions providers. Simply contact us by email or phone using the links on our website. It will take a couple of minutes to launch your demo environment, during which time I'll introduce you to the configuration under test and features at your control. When the environment is ready, three icons labeled Exchange Host, E Data Core Node for East Data Core Node, and W Data Core Node for West Data Core Node will appear in the lower left corner of your browser window. At that time, you'll click on the Exchange Host to remotely access it. Normally, Sans Symphony V would be controlled from a freestanding PC, but for your convenience, we have also installed its management console on the Exchange Host. That gives you a chance to see side by side what's going on at the host and on the two Sans Symphony V nodes. There's no need to log directly into the data core nodes except to shut them down if you wish. The desktop backgrounds are color coded for the three machines to give you a visual clue as to which one you were logged into at any given time. You'll get more from the exercise if you're familiar with the Windows Server operating system and have used Logical Disk Manager in the past before managing disks, but it's not necessary for a first look. Your environment consists of several physical and virtual hosts that depend on a pair of redundant Data Core Sans Symphony V nodes for their virtual shared storage infrastructure. It's representative of a mid sized IT organization. The two data core nodes are standard Windows Server 2008 R2 servers dedicated to running the Sans Symphony V software. Several hosts have been defined in the configuration as placeholders for the most popular server and hypervisors. The focus of your test drive will be the Exchange host, however, which is connected to the data core nodes via two independent iSCSI SAN paths, and it has an active workload running on it. The Exchange host has access to two virtual disks, Exchange Log and Exchange Data, which are mirrored between the data core nodes for high availability. Iometer, an industry standard generic disk load generator, is simulating a production workload by performing read and write operations on the virtual disk. Under normal conditions, both data core servers are under load in true active active fashion. Of course, you won't be able to appreciate the high performance attributes of our product through this virtual demo environment. It's merely set up for a quick, casual tour of the user interface. After the brief orientation of the Sans Symphony V user interface, I will perform non-disruptive planned maintenance of the virtual storage environment by shutting down one of the data core nodes. You'll see how the other node transparently takes over while applications continue uninterrupted. Then I'll bring the node back up and let Sans Symphony V restore full service. You'll see how the Exchange host automatically switches from its original preferred path to the alternate path and back again without user or administrator intervention. Again, the host never loses access to the virtual disk and is completely unaware that we have taken down half of the storage infrastructure. At the end of the presentation, you will be in full control of the Sans Symphony V environment. Without the benefit of training or guidance from a data core authorized solution provider, you could get into a little trouble, but don't worry. You can simply exit the test drive. The demo environment is rebuilt from scratch for the next user. On logging into the Exchange host, the Perfmon display will show you the reads and writes being generated by Iometer to the virtual disks. The graphs have been color coded to distinguish between the iSCSI paths being used. eDataCore node is the bright green line, and the traffic to WDataCore node is indicated by the bright red line. We also see the DataCore MPIO console. This is the user interface to DataCore's device specific module or extension for Windows native multi path or MPIO driver. This display indicates that all paths to both virtual disks are presently available and healthy. Double-clicking the Sans Symphony V icon located on the desktop brings up the management console. We are prompted to enter a server name. We may enter the name of either data core node in the group. 
A server group is the set of data core nodes that are in a collaborative configuration for management by a single interface. Let's accept the suggested server name, W data core node, and keep the default credentials box checked so that we can use the login credentials that were created at install time to gain full access to the configuration. We then see the Getting Started page appear in the main workspace. This appears on initial installation. This page is designed to lead beginning users through the steps of organizing, implementing, and managing the data core environment. Following the links one by one from top to bottom results in a fully configured SAM. Even if you should select a link out of order, you will be led via a wizard through the necessary steps to configure the parameters to complete the tasks. Experienced users may bypass the structured procedure and use the icons presented in the ribbon and the links presented in the console's panels. They may also be interested in some of the advanced choices available as they walk through the wizards. Since these systems have been pre-configured, the links that would ordinarily be blue are green to indicate that they have already been completed. Let's create and serve a new virtual disk to our Exchange host by clicking the Serve Virtual Disk link. You see that as I do so, I am immediately presented with a wizard's page indicating that there are several steps associated with this activity through which I will be led. In the first step, I am presented with a list of hosts to which I may serve the virtual disk. Note that at the bottom, I have a link to register a host, that is to remind me that if I cannot find the host in the presented list, I can define one that I may have recently added to the SAN environment. In this case, I will choose the Exchange host, however, which is connected and available. In the next step, I am prompted to choose a virtual disk. Since there are no unserved virtual disks available, the link prompts us to configure one now. On clicking that link, I am directed to the Virtual Disk Configuration Wizard. In the first step of creating the virtual disk, I'll give my volume an appropriate name. Let me add the word new to the suggested name. Moving down the page, I will choose to remain consistent with the virtual disks I've created previously and leave the settings to create a mirrored disk. I will move a step further down the page to define the size of my virtual disk. The suggested size remains that of the previously created disk. In this case, just to show off, I'll create a one petabyte disk to show off the thin provisioning capability I have. Now that I've completed everything on this page, I'll click the Next button to move to the next step. The next step is to choose from which pool I will provision the storage resource to my virtual disk. Note that since I've chosen to create a mirrored disk, I'm presented with all pools from both of my data core servers. Note too at this point, I may define a new pool if I wish to do so by the prompt in the link at the bottom of this page. Looks like my work is already done for me here, so I'll click Next to move along. The next step will allow me to configure any advanced options such as data protection and multipath mirroring. There's no need to do so just yet, and I can always modify my configuration later, so I'll just click Finish to proceed through this step after verifying what I've configured thus far at the top of the page is correct. Completing this previous step returns me to provisioning page where I may now select the newly created virtual disk. Note that the warning symbol indicates that this disk needs to perform a full recovery to initialize to a healthy mirror status. This notification doesn't prevent me from proceeding to the next step, however, so I'll click Next. This leads me to the last step in provisioning. I see here that I have a choice to use all front end points available on each data core server to serve the volume. I'll leave this setting at the default as well, since I only have one front end port defined on each server anyway. Nothing left to do now but click the Finish button. 
Completing this step takes care of non-disruptively presenting a fully configured, highly available disk resource to the Exchange host over the SAM. I see the new disk appear in the list of virtual volumes in the panel at the left hand side of the screen. All that remains now is to discover and format the new resource which appears to the host as a local storage device. I'll do this by moving to the logical disk manager window. A simple rescan brings the one petabyte disk resource into view. Those familiar with the Windows environment will recognize this as a routine exercise to configure new disk resource. Since this is such a large disk, I will initialize it as type GPT to enable me to use its full size. Now that the new disk is initialized, all that remains is to partition and format it. I'll create a modest 2 gigabyte disk here and format it now. There it is. That's all there is to creating a highly available, thin provision virtual disk and serving it to our host. Oh, by the way, if we take a look at the MPIO console, we may see that our new resource appears in the list of highly available data core server SAN provision disks. Since this display does not update in real time, it may not show immediately on serving the disk, so you can perform a refresh like so to refresh the view and bring the resource into the display. Before proceeding to your test drive, I want to take a moment to drive home the benefits of high availability. In this case, let's imagine that I've just been informed that some long overdue UPS or air conditioning maintenance needs to be performed in the data center where eDataCore node resides. This means the power needs to be shut off and so I must take down the node. No problem. Let me show you how easy it is to take this in stride. Now in this small environment, this emergency may not seem like such a big deal, but if I had tens, hundreds, or thousands of hosts, this emergency maintenance could be a stressful event. I'll simply use the management console to stop the data core server by right-clicking on the server. I'll acknowledge the pop-up, asking me if I'm sure. And what happens next? Well, I see that in my Perfmon display, I immediately switch off of the East Data Core node, and my West Data Core node takes up the slack and handles the additional I.O. Wonderful. All I need to do now is log into the host itself and shut it down so that I can give the maintenance people the all clear to begin their work. So let me log in remotely. And since this is a virtual environment, instead of shutting the server down, I'll simply reboot the server to simulate the event. Note that I can click on System Health in the Home ribbon to see the results of my actions taken. Notice that I have here a warning that now my East Data Core node is unavailable. Note also the list of critical items listed above the area where the warnings are indicating that I've got some, some systems that need some attention. But that's understandable since I've just taken half of my sand down. The System Health panel affords me a quick view of the status of my SAN and I can use it to drill down to find out the affected object status and isolate problem areas quickly. It's a valuable feature that you should be sure to check out during your test drive. Okay, so I've now just learned that the maintenance is complete and I've gotten the call indicating the all clear has been given. Notice that the status for ETH data core node in the health window has changed from unavailable to stopped, which indicates the server has been brought up. 
Before I return this node to service, I want to check that nothing was disruptive, such as a cable being left unplugged or a frame left powered down after the maintenance that would prevent a smooth return to service. I simply double click on the warning message and check my disk pools. My disk pools show me that they're in read-only mode, which is to be expected because this storage node is still offline. I might go to the disk, physical disk tabs to check that all my disks are present and available and online, and I see that they are. Finally, I'll check to make sure that my ports are all plugged in and connected. Uh, I see that my target ports are not started yet, which is also to be expected in this case. Okay, everything's healthy. So I will go ahead and start this node like so. And you can see that the system is now transitioning back to full availability. After the virtual volumes are restored and healthy, we see that the Exchange host detects that all paths are again present and our I.O. load is redistributed to the preferred paths. All of this without any storage administrator intervention or any disruption in host service. Now that's what I call business continuance. This concludes our introductory tour. Your fully functional and full featured demonstration environment should now be ready for your use. Remember to click on the appropriately labeled icon to gain access to the server's desktop. You'll want to focus on the Exchange host. Enjoy yourself and remember that if you have any further questions you may contact us by email or phone using the links on our website.